Hello, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Just Cause Robotics. In my last video, I pretty much talked about CNC machining generally, but in this one, I'd like to provide a bit of commentary about the process I went through for actually going about making these parts. And in my next video, I'll try and talk a little bit more about the actual process of doing the computer-aided machining cam side of things for setting up these more the more complicated parts that I'll be making in my next vid. So to start out here, I'm making the base plates for my 12-pound bot Draconid. Um, here I pretty much have most of the surface area of the base plate pocketed out to about half of the depth that the material starts as, which is a quarter inch. So most of it's being pocketed out an eighth inch. And I'm using a half inch cutter to do the bulk of this work because even with such a large diameter cutter where I can make a full depth pass and get rid of the material pretty quickly, this is still pretty time intensive. I think it took about uh, 10 minutes or so with the half inch cutter and then I clean up here with a six millimeter cutter because this way I can get sharper corners and remove a bit more material from the corners here and also just generally get the part to look a little bit nicer. And I'm also cleaning up the edges with contour passes, as you'll see at the end here. So, using a combination of a large bit to rough out a lot of material, and then a small bit to get the details in, is pretty common in machining. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. It was at this moment that I realized I had just put a drill in the tool holder, and in my cam I programmed that tool in as tool number 49, but when I was setting the tool height for it, I entered it into tool 39. Um, so that horrible crash was the result of that. Fortunately, all I ended up with was the hole being a bit ovaloid on the reverse side, and the part was actually not bent and was otherwise pretty much perfectly usable. So. Here you can see I am checking with my largest tool, which is the half inch tool, basically just to make sure that its zero point is still actually touching the part. And I, pre prior to that, actually readjusted the drill because it got pushed up into the tool holder a little bit, so I basically just reset it to its original programmed length. The drill didn't break or bend or anything, so it was actually not very long to recover from this. All of the footage that you're seeing in this entire video, by the way, is being played back at exactly 12 times speed, other than where it's playing obviously at real time speed with audio, so you can tell exactly how long this all took. I think for th my last video I had about 3 hours of footage condensed into 11-ish minutes. This video was closer to 4 and a half hours of footage, so yeah. that puts things probably in perspective. Um, right now, what I'm doing is I first kind of roughed out a couple contour passes into what will eventually be countersinks using this 8th inch carbide bit. I did that basically just to put a bit of a lighter load on my chamfering tool, which I'll eventually be using to finish up all of the countersinks for these screws. And then I am milling in all of the screw pockets for the motor mount, and then the uh, actual slots for the screws beneath that. So I'm using basically a counterboard slot for each of the screws. I did make one small mistake when designing this part though. The central slot is where a little bit of the stub of the shaft of the motor sticks through. Um, and I gave it plenty of space for just the little bit of shaft on the motor, which is a 5mm shaft. But what I forgot to account for was the fact that there's a circlip stuck to the shaft. So I actually needed to uh, get in there with a deburring tool and pretty heavily rough out a little bit more of the material from the side that the motor actually mounts to to get the circlip to sit inside of that slot and thus have the motor actually sitting flush against the part. So if you are designing things to mount brushless motors directly to, um, do keep that in mind. And here you can see I'm finally coming with the chamfer tool. I'm, or the countersink tool rather, and I'm countersinking all of these holes and then doing some nice chamfer milling on all of the edges just to save myself the work of deburring and make the part look a lot prettier and 
make it a lot less post-processing work for me. And here you can see me making one from start to finish without horribly fucking it up in the middle. So again, pretty much just roughing out material as fast as possible with this half inch tool before coming in with the 6mm tool and sharpening all the corners, cleaning up all the edges. I did make a little bit of a mistake where I forgot to really carefully set the tool heights for the 6mm tool and the half inch tool at exactly the same time. I think that I swapped the 6mm tool at some point after setting up the half inch and it sat a little bit higher up than it probably should have, but I actually, a few days ago, finally spent the time needed to wire up the electronic tool setter that another member of the Makerspace had bought, so now I can get every single tool length set within about a thousandth of its actual length with very minimal effort, and it shouldn't be a big deal to swap tools in and out of the tool holders now like it has been in the past where I had to manually literally take, take a piece of paper, jog the tool down one thousandth at a time, rubbing the piece of paper back and forth until the tool caught it, and that was how I was zeroing all the tools, which meant every single time that I needed to zero in a new tool, I had to swap to a tool that I knew, set the Z zero by doing that process, then swap in the new tool, and do the same process again, just so that I could know that I was at the same zero point in order to get the tool length. With the electronic tool setter, what I've done is I've set up a work offset, um, G59 work offset, on the actual tool setter sitting on the base of the material. So to set that up, I took the tool setter, I, I sit, sat it on the, the bed of the Tormach itself, and then I used a 1-2-3 block, which is slightly taller than the tool setter, and did that whole paper, or, or I, I jogged the machine down until I could just, like, to, like, within five ten thousandths of an inch, just start to slide the one, two, three block under the spindle nose. And then I told the Tormach that that was exactly three inches above the bed. And then I slowly jogged down one thousandth at a time, and then eventually by tenths at a time, until it tripped the electronic tool setter. That way, I knew exactly what the effective height of the tool setter was. And so now, with a combination of having that work offset, putting the tool setter on roughly the same place on the bed, and knowing that the bed is very flat and level, I can, without having to use a prior tool, know exactly how long the tools stick out of the spindle nose. And therefore, I was able to not only set new tools, but I just reset every single tool's length because now that meant I had a new reference point for the length of any given tool. And here you can see my finished base plate part. With its horrible blemish from where the uh, call it nut rubbed against it when the drill crashed, but otherwise perfectly usable. So now you can see me making a much simpler part, which is almost the same in terms of its general form, which is the top armor for the robot. So this is also pretty heavily pocketed, but I left a diagonal strip to reinforce everything in the middle. So the diagonal portion is only pocketed down about a sixteenth of an inch, and then you can see most of the material is still being removed to about an eighth of an inch. And again, I'm using the half inch tool to hog out as much material as fast as possible, because this would take absolutely ages with the 6mm tool doing all of the work. And then again, I'm going to come in with the 6mm tool and clean up everything. This was around the point that I really noticed the uh, difference in the height between what the 6mm tool was supposed to be and what it actually was, because there's actually a pretty visible ridge where the 6mm tool is coming into the corners of material that's left where it should have been taken away since the 6mm tool was like slightly shorter than the machine thought it was. Here I didn't actually decide to spend time with the um, 8mm tool, or sorry, the 8th uh, inch tool, cleaning up all of the holes first. I pretty much just was like, screw it, and decided I would use the chamfering tool as intended 
and just hog out all of the material at a slower feed rate and uh, do the entire countersink at once. So that saved a lot of time on this part versus how I did it for the base blades. I did use the 8 inch tool to uh, do the holes for where eventually an NBOTS power switch will be. That's what the like four holes with one hole in the middle was in the top left corner. So again, swapping in the 6mm tool, cleaning up all of the corners. This time I didn't bother, I think, with a full contour pass because I wanted this to be faster. And then this is drilling with the number 9 drill bit, which provides clearance holes for all my 1024 screws. Drilling is like many, many times faster than boring with the 8th inch tool, which is what I did in a lot of the parts of my first video, just because those holes were blind holes so it's a little bit trickier to get your settings just right for drilling and there's a better chance that the chips will clog and uh, rip the drill in half. So yeah, that pretty much does it for the parts in this video. My next video I'll show machining of the front panel, the rear panel, and both the inner and outer drive pods. You can see the outside of the inner drive pods in this photo here. Thank you all for watching and feel free to come back for more content in my next video, which I'll try and release next week. I'm also going to be competing at Norwalk Havoc on January 18th, so I'll try and get a fight recap video up on Sunday after that competition.